thank you very much. Hi, everyone, again, and welcome. My name is Mitchell Zato. I'm the Managing Principal at Sharrock Pittman Legal, and thank you very much for joining us today for our webinar on recent changes to the Fair Work Act. Um, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which our office is located, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. And we extend this respect to all First Nations communities throughout Victoria and wherever you may be logging in from. And whether you have joined us for one of our webinars before, or if it is your first time, a uh, very warm welcome again. We hope these webinars are a helpful resource to share with you some must-know information and guidance on different topics uh, that we encounter day to day in our practice as lawyers, and which we think um, would be beneficial to share with you all. Um, you can catch up on the recordings and slides for previous webinars by heading to our website and clicking the link for our resources page, and you'll find there the webinars that we've done on um, from our lawyers on various issues from um, property law, commercial and business law, state planning, disputes, and of course, employment law, including our most recent employment law webinar on restraint of trade clauses in contracts. But today we're looking at some recent changes to the Fair Work Act, which have some far reaching impacts for employers and employees alike. And perhaps not surprisingly, this has been an area that's been moving fairly quickly since the change of government around 12 months ago. Um, so there's a fair bit to cover, um, but you're in good hands with Samuel and I know he's looking forward to um, taking you through today's content. So I'll shortly hand over to Samuel. And by way of introduction, Samuel is a senior associate here at Jarrock Pittman Legal, and he's also an accredited specialist in workplace relations law. So before we begin, I'll run through some um, housekeeping items just quickly. Um, we're obviously in webinar mode today, so your cameras are not visible, so do not worry. Um, and we are recording the session and it will be made available on our website uh, soon. If you do have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to type it away in the Q&A box uh, in, on your screen. We will try to get to questions as we go along, um, and we will also try to save some time at the end for questions. Um, but, if we are, but we are conscious of time, so if we do run out of time to get through all of the questions, um, don't worry, we will um, have a record of that and get back to you afterwards as soon as we can. And we'll also share our contact details with you at the end. So uh, do feel free to get in touch with us uh, from time to time or anything you might have queries on. Um, before we do get started, we are lawyers after all, so forgive us for some fine print. Um, needless to say, we can only give you some general guidance today. Um, everyone's situ situation and circumstances are different, and that's really important. Um, and this is an area where it's uh, especially important, I think, to be dotting the I's and crossing the T's carefully. So take this uh, information uh, in a general sense and do get some advice on your own um, situation when you need so now we'll get started and I'll hand over to Samuel. Thank you, Samuel. Thanks, Mitchell. And uh, as Mitchell was saying, we're just over 12 months into a new Labor government. And as part of uh, their election platform, uh, a key a key area that they did campaign on was uh, workplace relations and particularly getting pay moving uh, for employees. And we're 12 months in, we're probably uh, about I'd say we're a bit less than halfway if you look at the uh, the government's election manifesto in terms of the changes that they're wanting to introduce. So what I want to do today is have a high level overview of the changes to date and also have a, a bit of a discussion around what we can expect in the future. Now, this is by no means comprehensive. There's been quite a lot of changes, some of it quite substantial, some of it more tweaking around the edges. Uh, but what I've what I want to focus on today really is what I think for small and, and medium businesses, what you should be aware of uh, in terms of the existing changes over the last uh, few months and also looking forward. And you can see on the slide what I plan to cover uh, today. And we'll start by looking at changes that are relevant to employment agreements, employment contracts, uh, then move on to uh, working conditions, uh, including leave entitlements. And uh, we'll have a look at uh, some of the, uh, well, I suppose what probably is the, the most controversial part of the changes to date in, in uh, relation to enterprise agreements and multi-enterprise agreements. And then we'll have a look at what the government is planning next uh, before taking some questions from you. 
So the uh, the key uh, legislative change was uh, called, you know, secure jobs, better pay, which is a pretty good summary of what the government is intending with its legislative changes uh, to create uh, more secure work. Uh, and particularly, we would have seen, I think, in these changes to uh, encourage wages to move up uh, in, in real terms. The other, uh, I suppose, significant set of changes, and this predates the current government, it was the one that started with the previous government and has continued with this government, is implementing the respect at work uh, recommendations coming out of the Jenkins report. Uh, and there's also a, a, a range of things in relation to ensuring that uh, men and women are paid equally in the workplace. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, there are just some uh, a number of, I suppose, tweaks to the existing framework in terms of improving employee conditions at work that uh, really all businesses should be aware of. On the next slide, you can see that's a, a handful of the legislation to date. It's not comprehensive, but you can see uh, the parliament has been busy and we've got another uh, bill before the parliament at the moment as well. So what we're seeing is the government is periodically and quite frequently introducing uh, changes uh, piecemeal, and I expect that to continue throughout this term of the government. So let's start with a couple of changes that are relevant to uh, employment agreements. And the first change I want to talk about is the changes uh, in relation to fixed or maximum term contracts. Now these are contracts where uh, a business engages a permanent, so full-time, part-time employee for an agreed amount of time. It might be, uh, say, you've got a, a teacher who's employed on a 12-month fixed-term contract, uh, or you know, where the, the essence of it is that at a defined point in time, the employment will come to an end. Uh, there, the introduction of uh, the, this, uh, this legislation puts a restriction on the extent to which businesses can use these kind of contracts. So previously, there wasn't any real restriction. You could continue if you have say, a one 12 month contract and then you renew it and uh, the person continues on fixed term contracts and they never actually become a permanent employee. Uh, the government has said in these, am or in these amendments that it's, uh, it's much uh, more, only, only limited circumstances will that now be possible. So you can see on the screen, basically as a general rule, you can't have uh, an employee on a fixed term contract if the fixed term contract or a series of fixed term contracts exceeds two years or is renewable more than once. So say you had a one six month contract, you could have a second six month contract, but you couldn't have a third uh, six month contract. Uh, there are some exceptions, uh, that, but though they are relatively narrow, extracted, I think, what are the most important ones on the screen. Uh, so if you've got work that uh, requires a distinct and identifiable task with specialised skills, so maybe uh, you are bringing on a consultant that's not directly relevant to your ordinary business at a, dis a distinct and identifiable task, you will need to engage them. That might be a circumstance where the general rule doesn't apply. You can use fixed term contracts for, to fill a temporary absence of another employee. So an example would be if you've got an employee on parental leave, you can use fixed term contracts in those circumstances. The employee is over earning above the high income threshold, the rule doesn't apply. Uh, that's currently $162,000. It will be increasing on the 1st of July. And there's a, there's a narrow exception for government funded contracts that that the, where the funding is for over a two year, for in excess of a two year period. This change, and the feedback we're getting is this change is probably affecting the not-for-profit sector more than, than many other sectors because they do depend on short-term government funding. And one of the issues uh, not for the, profit, the not-for-profit sector has is that if they're, if they're on 12 month contracts and, and they can't, and they renew them and tie to funding. There's a question that, but from a governance perspective, whether they should be budgeting for redundancy pay if they can't use fixed term contracts. And unfortunately, for, for most not for profits, their funding arrangements are not for two years, they tend to be 12, 12 months. And so this acceptance is not particularly going to help them. 
And there's also uh, an obligation, I mean, the, the exception that really only applies uh, if there's no uh, prospect of the contract, the funding being renewed. So it basically means that that sector needs to move away from fixed term contracts. And there's gonna be a number of sectors that this impacts, the not-for-profit sector, the education sector uh, would be key ones. But I suppose the takeaway for today is that if you are using fixed term contracts, it's important to uh, review the way that you issue fixed term contracts. And if you are, and making sure that whenever you're offering a fixed term contract that you're, you're working through and making sure that you're not breaching these provisions. Now, we expect this to come into effect on the 6th of December of this year. So you've got a little bit of a leeway to get uh, in place. It could be declared earlier, but the minister said it won't commence before the 6th of December of this year. So use the remaining months of the year to review your, your policies and procedures and uh, move away from fixed term contracts. Well, important also to note just before moving on that it also applies, while well, the law applies to new contracts, the, uh, the period of time will apply to existing employees. So if you've got employees who have been on fixed term contracts, uh, you, you won't be able to offer new ones from the 6th of December. The next uh, thing I want to talk about is the new pay secrecy provisions. And this is really to encourage, uh, I suppose, employees to, to talk about their pay and, and, and equalize pay across the workplace, uh, particularly I think to improve uh, the outcomes of women in terms of remuneration. And what, uh, so what the, uh, the legislation has done is there's now a positive right on employees to disclose their remuneration uh, and the terms and conditions of employment relevant to remuneration. So you know, both the dollar figure that they're receiving and uh, benefits or conditions or things that, that are relevant to their remuneration structure, which is pretty broad. And employees also have a right to ask other employees about their remuneration. That's both within the workplace and uh, of any other business as well. So it's a, it's a broad right to encourage employees to discuss remuneration. And for businesses, because these are now positive rights, the key is to make sure that, one, you're not trying to stop employees talking about their remuneration, and two, that uh, you don't treat them adversely, but if they do so, you'd be exposing yourself to a general protections claim if you were to uh, take adverse action against employees because they're talking about their remuneration. So you need to be careful. And if you're a larger business, to make sure that your managers uh, are also aware of these changes. And, and another takeaway, and this, I think, probably catch out quite a few employers, it's now unlawful to have uh, pay secrecy clauses in employment contracts. And uh, what I would do is I'd recommend actually going and having a look at your employment agreements. You might not think that you had a clause around pay secrecy, but a lot of employment agreements uh, will have a general confidentiality clause. And uh, in my view, those uh, are now problematic. So I'd be having a look at your employment agreements and removing or, or significantly narrowing any confidentiality clauses that relate to the terms of the employment agreement itself. All right, so that's our employment contracts. Turning to working conditions. So I'll just interrupt one moment. Um, somebody has raised their hands. Um, uh, if I could just ask you to put your um, question in the Q&A box if you do have a question and we'll, um, we'll get to questions um, as soon as we can as we go along. Thank you, Sam. So turning to, to working conditions, a couple of uh, changes to the, the, uh, the way the Fair Work Act works in relation to um, flexible working arrangements and unpaid parental leave, and they're, they're quite similar. Uh, the changes, so, but we'll cover them both. So, uh, as uh, you're probably aware, employees who've worked for 12 months, either on a permanent or on a regular casual basis, uh, can make a request for flexible working arrangements uh, in certain circumstances, say they've got um, children uh, that they need to look after and that kind of thing. And there's, that's been in the Fair Work Act uh, since the beginning. What has changed is there's a more extensive consultation process now for employers considering uh, those requests. So you always had to consider the request, you had to provide a response in writing as to whether you accepted it or not. 
there's what the legislation has done, the, the amending legislation is, uh, it's fleshed out a bit what's expected of employers. So there's a positive obligation to consult, uh, to discuss if you're looking to reject or vary a, an employee's request, you need to have a discussion uh, with them before you do that. And uh, you uh, will need to advise them in writing of the reason why you're rejecting. And, in, and in, as part of your decision-making, you need to factor in the impact on the employee of, of saying no to the request. So if you are receiving uh, flexible working arrangement requests, I think they're fairly common. Employees often make these requests. And it's important that you've got the process there to make sure that you're dealing with it in the appropriate way. You're considering the things that need to be considered and you're letting the employees know your decision in, in the right way within the 21 day time limit. The other significant change in this area is that previously there was an obligation on employers uh, to consider the request and you could you can refuse the request on reasonable business grounds. That decision previously was something solely for the business and not something that the Fair Work Commission or the courts could look at. That has now changed. So if an employee is unhappy with the decision previously, they couldn't do anything about it. But now, uh, if they are unhappy with a decision, they can take the matter to the Fair Work Commission. And the Fair Work Commission has the power to deal with the dispute. And normally it would uh, deal with it by conciliation, so trying to get the parties to get the parties to sit down and see if you can come to an agreed resolution. But if that's not possible, then the Fair Work Commission can arbitrate the dispute. And that means that the Fair Work Commission can make the decision for you. So we haven't, uh, it'll be interesting to see how much this is used, but it is a significant. Uh, new power uh, for the commission, and I'd expect that we, we see quite a lot of a uh, lot of employees utilising this if they're not getting the outcome that they're seeking from their employer. Uh, very similar to that uh, is there's new couple of uh, with unpaid parental leave. There's a similar uh, discretionary item element for uh, employees and employers when it came to having an additional 12 months of unpaid parental leave. So uh, as you're probably aware, employees can work for 12 months uh, as a permanent or regular casual employee, they can take up to 12 months of unpaid parental leave. Uh, there's also the option for an employee uh, to ask for an additional 12 months beyond the first 12 months. And similar to flexible working arrangements, an employer has to consider the request and they can refuse on reasonable business grounds same changes in terms of the consultation that were made for flexible working arrangements have also been made for considering requests for an extension to unpaid parental leave and the same dispute resolution procedure applies so you do have an employee that comes to you and asks for 12 months beyond their original 12 months of unpaid parental leave if you uh, refuse that re request then they can take the matter to the fair work commission The other change, and this one has been uh, occurring, I suppose, progressively, uh, is to paid family and, and domestic violence leave. You might remember a couple of years ago, the Fair Work Commission introduced uh, five days of unpaid family and domestic violence leave into awards, and that's moved up to becoming a, a, an entitlement of, of all employees under the National Employment Standards of the Fair Work Act. And it's uh, recently become 10 days of paid rather than unpaid family and domestic violence leave. Uh, it is only 10 days within a year, so it doesn't accrue from year to year, unlike uh, personal leave, uh, but it is paid. And it applies to all employees. It's not just for permanent employees, so casuals receive the benefit as well. For larger employers, uh, this is already in force. Uh, for small business employers, employers, with less than 15 employees, this is commencing on the 1st of August, 2023. So that's uh, important to be aware of and important to uh, uh, be conscious of when uh, you might get employees that are, that are making these requests, you probably be good to have your employees aware that this entitlement is there for them. And in terms of how you, change in terms of how you record this on pay slips, uh, which recently was introduced. So previously, uh, obviously you should record, keep records of any uh, paid 
uh, family and domestic violence leave that you're providing. However, to reduce the risk of a particularly a violent partner who might have access to an employee's pay slips, uh, realizing that, a, that an employee is utilizing this leave, or maybe even they're in the workplace, you, you do get uh, situations where uh, partners might be in the same workplace, then uh, the, the regulations now provide that family and domestic violence leave is not to be recorded as any form of leave. It needs to be re recorded as ordinary pay or some other performance-based payment so that somebody looking at a pay slip would not realise that the employee has been taking uh, family and domestic violence leave. You should, of course, keep your own records of that leave taken, but it, it should not show up on pay slips. I um, might pause there just for a couple of questions that have come in, um, Samuel, on, on, the, on what you've gone through so far, just on this um, issue of the domestic violence leave. Um, how do we validate uh, domestic violence leave? Would it need to be even perhaps include a letter from the police or, or what are the requirements? There, there, yeah, you, you are entitled to ask for evidence uh, and uh, evidence that is that is reasonable to satisfy. I wouldn't, and look, I, I don't have the section right in front of me, but uh, I wouldn't be overly restrictive in terms of the evidence that you're requiring. This is obviously a very sensitive um, area. I mean, a letter, a letter from the, the if you've got an appointment to to see a doctor or a, a psychologist or needs to go to um, you know, emergency care or something. I mean, obviously a letter would be something that's probably quite reasonable to ask, but it, it really does depend on the circumstances. So yes, you have a right to, to require reasonable evidence, but I, I wouldn't set the threshold for uh, too high. Thanks, Samuel. And a question about flexible work arrangements. Uh, if the workplace is in a factory where hours are fixed, can the employer refuse flexible working arrangements as it disrupts the operation of the business? Yeah, and look, I'm going to give the classic lawyer answer of, of saying that it depends. Uh, and it is, it's a matter of working through is, is the request reasonable for the business? What's the impact on the employee if I refuse the request? So it, it is going to depend. And previously, you could make that decision on your own and it wasn't uh, something that could be challenged, but uh, it can now be challenged. And I'm expecting that we will get guidance from the commission as to what they're expecting. And there's, there's going to be a lot of factors that go into it. The small, a smaller business, it might be hard to make those adjustments. A larger business, it, it might be not too difficult to, to make changes to rosters. So it, it really will depend. And uh, just a final question, going back to the um, secrecy clauses in contract, Samuel, does that mean um, employers need to review and reissue employment contracts or letters of offer if um, the existing agreements do have a secrecy clause that would fall foul of the, the new changes? You should review your templates. So you don't need to change existing contracts, but you can't, you shouldn't enter into new contracts uh, with the with pay secrecy clauses in them. The other thing I'd add there is um, the law will always override um, a clause in an employment contract or any contract um, if it doesn't comply with the law that's in force at that time. So. Thank you, Samuel. Yep, yep I think that might be on the next slide. Uh, a few changes following from the, uh, the respected work, the Jenkins report. Uh, some of this started with the previous government, as I said before. There's a new prohibition in the uh, Federal Sex Discrimination Act on harassment on the basis of sex, which is kind of a, in, to fill a gap between um, discrimination on the basis of sex and sexual harassment. You might get harassment that isn't sexual in nature, but is still on the basis of sex, you know, characteristics that are, that are identified with a particular sex. And so there's a, this new provision is, is to outlaw harassment uh, on that basis where it falls short of sexual harassment, but it's still uh, gendered. And there's also a new prohibition on subjecting a person to a workplace environment that is hostile on the ground of sex. Again, I mean, we saw this very much uh, in Parliament, but uh, this is the, the flow on that is now uh, explicitly in the Sex Discrimination Act that employers need to make sure that they're not, um, they don't have a workplace which is hostile uh, to 
to people on the basis of their sex. Uh, so it's something to be mindful of. And you obviously already had obligations under health and safety legislation, but this uh, makes it explicit. And there's also a new federal positive duty on employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate unlawful sex discrimination. So that would include you know, sex discrimination, sexual harassment, discrimination, harassment on the basis of sex, et cetera. We already have something similar in Victoria uh, under the Equal Opportunity Act, but it is, a, I think, a helpful reminder that the expectation now in dealing with um, sex discrimination or sexual harassment is it's not enough to be reactive and that you do need to be proactive. And that means, and it's going to depend what's on the individual business, what is appropriate, but I would think as a minimum for uh, a business of any reasonable size that that's having policies in place, having appropriate training, having the team aware of what is expected and what is and is not acceptable conduct. Uh, I don't think it's enough just to properly deal with complaints when they arise. You really do need to be out there making sure that employees know what is expected of them. And again, the bigger you are, I think that the more the, the expectation will be there. Relevant to this actually is the other we have, there's a, been a change to uh, the Workplace Gender Equality Act. Uh, previously, this has been in place, well, since 2020, 12, sorry, 2012, but it previously only applied to quite large businesses. Uh, but uh, since, well, starting next year, uh, though you really need to be onto it now, there will be a reporting requirements for employers with 100 or more employees to report uh, their gender pay gap to the Workplace Gender Equality Authority. And this is commencing, I think it's the, it'll be the first quarter of 20. You've got until the first quarter of 2024 to submit, uh, start making submissions in, in 2024. And what this means is you're, if you're 100 or more, you have 100 or more employees across your corporate group, so it's not just individual company, across your corporate group, you're going to need to prepare these reports. And you're going to need to be collecting the data for it now. And so that, that includes, you know, the proportion of your employees that uh, of a specific gender, the, the remuneration of those employees. Uh, and it also includes collecting information and reporting about some of the things we were discussing before around how you manage sex discrimination, sexual harassment, the, the proactive measures that you're taking to prevent sexual harassment and sex discrimination in the workforce, and all of that needs to be reported. So it's important to be working through those things now and, and getting ready to report from April next year. And uh, those reports, I mean, there's some exclusion for remuneration information, but those reports be available to employers, to unions, to shareholders. Uh, and uh, so it'll be quite well known where you're sitting and they look at you know what's your average what's the, the median wage and what's the average wage the mean wage that uh, women in your workforce get compared to what men get uh, so really we're trying to encourage and get employers to focus on making sure that men and women are paid uh, equal within the workforce so if you are over that 100 employee uh, point uh, important to have a look at those I'd say sooner rather than later in preparation for next year. All right, moving on to enterprise agreements and industrial bargaining. And this is probably the section of the change that was the most controversial and has received the most media attention. And I'm, it is quite a complex and quite a significant change. And I'm not going to go through everything. I've just selected a couple of things that I think uh, might be helpful for people uh, to understand, particularly small and medium businesses. So starting off, there's been some changes to the better off overall test. Uh, if you know anything about enterprise agreements, you'll know that the, the key test for whether an enterprise agreement can be approved or not is whether it makes employees better off overall compared to the award that they would be covered by uh, if, they, if there was no enterprise agreement. And it's been a bit of a, I think both sides of politics and certainly across the industrial landscape, a broad agreement that the boot wasn't working particularly well. It was too narrow. It was too technical. Uh, 
And so there's been a, a couple of changes. I'll just highlight, I think the first one's, uh, I suppose, a positive change in terms of saying what the commission should consider. So the commission should consider, you're taking a holistic global approach to whether employees are better off overall, rather than a line by line, does it? Does each individual entitlement uh, result in a better outcome for the employee? Now, the legislation now says that the commission may have regard to the reasonable perceivable patterns or kinds of work that employees may perform in assessing whether employees will be better off overall compared to the relevant award. As the, the positive for employers there is it does mean that it needs to be reasonably foreseeable what the employees are doing. It's not every, any hypothetical possibility. It's something that's actually practical and likely to happen. I suppose the flip side of that is that it's also open for employees and unions to argue that uh, whilst you've got no employees at the minute that are working in a particular way, you might have them working in that way, in a particular way, say certain shifts uh, in the future and, and, and ask the Commission to take that into consideration. So It'd be interesting to see how that one plays out, but it's only the, the intent there is for the Commission to take a, a practical approach when assessing the boot. Uh, the second change I'll highlight, and this one uh, could be a bit more of a headache for employers. Currently, well, prior to today, actually, when the, the, this amendment comes into force, the Commission would assess the boot at the time of the application. However, and then you know you have the enterprise agreement could be up to four years and it's locked in for four years. That's changed uh, as of today. So now if an employee or their union is unhappy with how an enterprise agreement is operating two, three years into it, uh, say you'd agreed to 3% annual pay rises and inflation's running high and the Fair Work Commission keeps uh, giving pay rises at 6%, the gap between the wages under the enterprise agreement and under the relevant award have now closed. Uh, it's open for employees or unions to apply to the commission to have the boot reassessed. And so what previously might have been a locked in enterprise agreement is not necessarily uh, any longer because the, an employee or the union can apply to the commission and have the commission reconsider the boot. So that's just certainly something to watch over over the course of the next few years, it would be interesting to see how much that provision is utilised. But it does mean if you do have an enterprise agreement, you're negotiating an enterprise agreement that you're conscious that you're actually building in uh, over the life of the agreement that it's going to be better off than what is likely under the award. The second change I want to talk about is the much uh, much talked about in the media, changes to multi-enterprise agreements. And there's three different streams of, of multi-enterprise agreements. I'm only going to talk about one. This is a, the, what we call the new single interest employer agreements. Uh, as This, I think, is probably the most controversial and, and the one that's the most uncertain in terms of how it, how it could play out in reality. So currently, uh, you... Well, prior to today, when this again commences, and you could only enter into a multi-enterprise agreement of this nature with the agreement of the employers. That is changing. Uh, there will be circumstances where employers can be required to bargain for an enterprise agreement, uh, not just uh, with their own employees, but more broadly as part of uh, multi-enterprise bargaining. And I've got on the screen uh, some of the, the key criteria for this, uh, for where this uh, could apply. The starting point is that the commission needs to make uh, an order for bargaining of this kind to commence. It's called a single interest employer authorization. And uh, both unions and employers can apply. So it's not, not employees on their own, but uh, employees who are represented by a union through their union. And the Fair Work Commission must make this authorization, and, and we'll go through these in a little bit more detail on the next slide, but uh, the employees must have union representation. So you can see this is very much uh, something that's been requested by the union movement, and it's uh, unions are looking to use these provisions uh, in, in workplaces where they have a presence. 
the employers need to be common interest employers. And we'll expand on this a little bit. You'd think on first reading that common interest is probably pretty narrow. Uh, I mean, not maybe you know businesses that are in a joint venture or that kind of thing, uh, but the the uncertainty really is around how broad is common interest because you, you you hear the word common interest, you think that's probably pretty narrow, but then you look at what the commission's to consider in determining whether employers have a common interest, and it's quite broad. And the next two requirements is in, this only applies to employers with twenty or more employees. So if you've got 19 and you don't want to participate in this stream, uh, you won't be forced to. Uh, but as soon as you hit the 20 employee threshold, uh, then you could be brought into this stream, which is not a particularly high threshold. There's plenty of, I think, technically under the act, small businesses less than 14, but I think probably a lot of businesses, you know, 30, 40, probably don't see themselves as big businesses. And uh, I mean, as much as this is interesting for me, probably might not want to pay me uh, to be engaged in multi-enterprise bargaining, but that is the, the reality. Uh, and, you know, it's only 20 employers. I think that's probably been one of the more controversial aspects of this legislation. However, having said that, there is, there is still the requirement that exists at the moment that a majority of your employees actually need to want this enterprise agreement. And there's been a lot of concern uh, amongst the business community and amongst um, lawyers representing employers about these changes and how they're going to impact uh, employers. It is, I think, important and, and businesses can take comfort that you do actually need uh, a majority of your employees to, to want this to, for it to actually be an issue for you. So it's a little bit uncertain how the majority is going to be determined. The commission and can use whatever method it likes in working out whether a majority of your employees want to bargain. So it's not like a formal vote, which is what is the process uh, previously, but there is that threshold, which I think would probably should give uh, employers a level of comfort, uh, particularly if you're not an existing unionized work, don't have an existing unionized workforce. We go to the next slide. So common interest, this I think is the big question uh, with this new multi-enterprise bargaining, what is a common interest? Uh, and the, the legislation sets out a few uh, things to consider. So businesses that are carrying on a similar business as franchisees, the one franchise, so that's, I think, fairly clear. There's a clear intent that you might have enterprise agreements that apply across a franchise. So if you're uh, a franchisee, this is certainly something that uh, that you should be aware of, uh, and it may well impact you in the future. Second is to have a clearly identified common interest with other employers. And uh, again, that comes back to the question of what does that actually mean? We don't really know at this point, but the employer's operations are reasonably comparable. And in assessing that, and we're looking at things like geography, the regulatory regime, the nature of the businesses, you know, their size, their scope, their employment conditions. And I think this is where the uncertainty comes in is because, I mean, that could be very broad. If you've got the same regulatory regime, does that mean that you know, all accountants uh, have a common interest? I would think not, but you, it invites that kind of question. If geographical location, does it, every kind of business in say Melbourne have a particular uh, interest? Again, probably not, but we don't know. And uh, when the minister was asked this question, he basically said, well, the Fair Work Commission will tell us. So we, ex we can expect, I think, to see a bit of litigation in this space. And it'll be interesting to see how, how broad uh, a scope the union movement argues for uh, as they're, they're trying to get these multi-enterprise agreements up. Uh, so just something to be aware of. I don't want you to be alarmed. Uh, this is certainly not going to I, would, I wouldn't predict that it's going to be the norm that employers are going to be roped into multi-enterprise agreements but they're uh, particularly in in sectors where there's high um, unionization I would expect these to to become more and more common and uh, we'll know in in the months and years ahead just also on the common interest I'm just going back there is a presumption if you've got more than 50 employees that there's a common interest and then it's for you as the employer to rebut that presumption. 
which also adds uncertainty, I think, to employers, there's that presumption. And the other point to note is that unions, you, you might not be involved in the initial negotiation of an enterprise agreement, uh, but you might be roped in later because uh, there's a power for uh, unions to apply to the commission to vary these enterprise agreements to include new employers. And so I mean, it's pretty clear what the intent is. Uh, we expect unions you'll ne negotiate with a core group of employers, get an enterprise agreement up, and then once those terms are negotiated, add in a whole heap of new employers who weren't part of the original negotiation. If you're going back pre-1996, if you've been in business for a while, you might remember that's how things operated previously and it's coming back. So that I think that particular concern for, for businesses where you've got, you might get key players in an industry setting terms by agreement with unions, and then the whole um, industry gets brought along Again, got to have that common interest test. It'd be interesting to see how that plays out. But if it is interpreted broadly, these could have quite a broad scope. So that's my the summary of, uh, I suppose, the key points for the existing changes. Uh, we've got a couple of, of new changes that are coming in. So one before the parliament right at this moment. Probably the main one out of this is the unpaid parental leave entitlements. So uh, currently employees, they have the 12 months um, unpaid parental leave. They can take, I think it's uh, eight weeks of that flexibly. That's increasing to 20 weeks across the 24 month period. So whereas previously the vast majority of that 12 month unpaid leave needed to be taken in a single block. Uh, now it'll be 20 weeks uh, that will be able to be taken flexibly, and that includes in the individual days. So up to 20 weeks can be taken on a day-to-day -day basis across a 24-month period. So it gives it more flexibility to employees, but it does mean it's a little bit harder to for employers to, uh, I suppose, manage employees who are away on, on unpaid leave. Not your law yet, but I'm expecting it to be the law uh, imminently. Uh, there's also new protections for migrant workers, which I think is pretty common sense, but just a reminder, sometimes employers, they put a lot of work into helping uh, employees on, on skilled visas come in, do a lot of favours for them, and then uh, something goes wrong and employer, the employee claims that they're being underpaid. Uh, the fact that uh, they're, they're on a visa and you've done things for them doesn't mean that uh, you can't pay them correctly. And similarly, if there's been breaches of their visa conditions, you can't use that um, against them. And that's what the, the legislation is clarifying. So just uh, don't be tempted. Uh, and the other change is that superannuation will now form a part of the national employment standards. Now this is probably a pretty technical change, but it's an important one. Currently superannuation is enforced through the tax system and it has been difficult for employees to actually sue employers for unpaid superannuation. Uh, that that's, uh, that will change. So it, employees will be able to pursue employers in the same way uh, for superannuation in the same way as they can for any other employment entitlement. So not part of this change, but something to take note of. The government has announced that from the 1st of July 2026, superannuation will be paid on the same day as wages are paid. So it won't be quarterly. Uh, as most small businesses are now, or or, um, or monthly, if part of you, but, um, it'll be uh, just same as wages. So you'll need to think of superannuation as wages. So, quick question, Samuel, about um, the unpaid parental leave entitlements. Um, for unpaid parental leave, can the employee take this without notice uh, to take single days? No, that look, there are notice requirements. I'd have to. I'd have to have a look in terms of taking individual days, but there are notice requirements. And in terms of what is next, and this is the government's just finished a consultation process. And these are some of the things that it's, the government is looking to implement. I would imagine across the remainder of this term of government, 
So uh, the government said they want to revisit the definition of a casual employee. You've been following this space for, for the last you know, five, six years. It's been a bit of a roller coaster ride as to what a casual employee is. And at the moment, uh, with both the legislation and the High Court, uh, it's clear that whether a person is a casual employee is assessed at the time that you enter into the contract. And so if the contract says that they're a casual employee and engaged uh, on a not not on a basis that that looks like permanent employment, then uh, they're probably a casual employee. We expect that um, the government not particularly happy with that outcome, and so you can expect a probably a move back to what we understood around going back 2017 or so, where you're making a more holistic assessment across the course of the employment is the employee working um, regular hours, predictable hours. Maybe if they are, they, they might actually be a permanent employee rather than a casual employee. So uh, do what's that space. Uh, the other major change, and I think uh, this is probably the most controversial aspect of the next stage of, of legislative changes is uh, there's going to be new requirements around same job, same pay targeted at labour hire. So currently, businesses might have employees that might have enterprise agreements that can often get better conditions than people they bring in through labour hire companies and that the government is basically wanting to, to outlaw those kind of arrangements, saying if you're using labour hire, you've got to pay them the same as you pay uh, your employees. So if you are using labour hire workers, uh, it, this is certainly something to watch out for. We're also likely to see um, a national labour hire regime for licensing. There's already one in Victoria, but that we expect to be nationalised. We expect to see wage theft criminalised. Again, it's already been criminalised in Victoria, but we expect to see that occur at a national level. And we're also expecting for there to be new regulation around particularly the gig economy and uh, the road transport industry, which, I mean, I've got there on the slide, I think Uber, but it, basically it'll be broader than that. There's a, quite a lot of use of contractors in the road transport industry. And I think what we're going to see is that kind of contracting arrangement become more regulated, similar to what employees are. So the commission, we expect we are to set minimum pay standards, uh, minimum conditions of work, similar to what they do for employees already. And uh, we're also expecting new restrictions, or oh, sorry, new, new ability on uh, contractors to challenge unfair contract terms. They have some limited rights in that space already, but we're expecting there to be more so that's, that's uh, I suppose, what we can probably expect across uh, the rest of this term of government. And I think that's it from me, just also just not related to the changes in the legislation, but uh, remember the, uh, the commission has increased wage rates for awards and the minimum wage and superannuation is going up to 11% on the 1st of July. Busy time in the world of employment law. Thanks, Samuel. We do have time for um, one or two more questions if uh, people would like. Um, in the meantime, um, I would just let you know about our website. Um, there are some good, really good articles on there um, about different things to do with um, employment law and, and contractors in this space. Um, and we're always um, putting new content and updates on there, um, which will um, share through our um, LinkedIn page and, and other social media channels. So um, do take a look at that uh, from time to time if you'd like to keep up with things. And also we have a couple of employment law guides um, that you can download from our website as well. Or if you would like some hard copy booklets of those sent to you, um, just get in touch and we'd be happy to do that. Um, so guides to um, employment law in general, um, and also uh, managing the dismissal of an employee, which is a whole other topic of conversation, um, but some um, really good pointers in there, another area where you do need to tread very carefully, of course. Um, so thank you very much, um, Samuel. Thank you very much for the comments and questions, everybody. Um, hope you found that helpful. Um, we'll have another webinar uh, coming up uh, next month in late July. 
um, from our litigation team. So you can pencil it in for 25th of July. If you'd like, we'll have more details about that uh, very soon. And uh, finally, a quick plug, if you'll allow me, um, just uh, the, again, the book, uh, Fighting for Enterprise Success by David Sharrock, who um, some of you may know, former managing principal here um, before he retired a couple of years ago. Um, if you're interested in looking at how a systems approach can help drive excellence and high performance in your business or organisation, do take a look at the website there um, and some samples and, and more information about the book. It's full of lots of wisdom, guidance and reflection from David and also um, lots of samples, self-assessment tools and things that we've been doing in our own business um, which may be of help um, in adapting for yours. So thank you very much again for joining us, everybody. Um, as you said, there's our contact details, particularly Samuels, if you've got something employment law related on your mind, do feel free to get in touch by phone or by email. Always happy to um, help you out and, um, and do follow us on the social media channels to keep up to date with things. Uh, this is a, a space, as we were saying before, where there is a lot of change. So we're always um, posting updates and things along the way. So that brings us to the end. Thank you very much for joining us again. And uh, as I said, do get in touch with any queries. But in the meantime, we wish you all the best and hope you have a great day. Thank you very much.